Hey there, it's Olivia Savannah here from Olivia's Catastrophe and today I'm here to give you my May wrap up part two. I read 17 books in May and I ambitiously thought I was going to fit it all into one video but I did not so here we go with the other books that I read this month. I'll have content warnings in the description box down below but without further ado let's get right down to the books, the rest of the books that I read in May. So first of all I want to start with a book I was very excited to read and that is a graphic novel called The Last Count of Monte Cristo by Tristan Roach and Daisy Jammer Everett. This is a graphic novel retelling of The Count of Monte Cristo which I read last year. This is an Afrofuturist retelling, a cli-fi book with climate change science fiction involved and I thought it was the good side of okay. I adored the first half of this book. I thought it was fantastic. It was following the original story to the letter but by having a black main character and by having it set in the future with the way that the world has degraded due to climate change it was just putting such a unique spin on things it made the story of the Count of Monte Cristo and the false imprisonment all the more realistic and just added a whole nother layer to it especially when you think of how dangerous the outside world is because of the climate change effects love 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 the artwork in this is stunning i think you can already see it on the cover but the colors within this book are fantastic and i just thought it was just such a really afrofuturist way to illustrate a lot of the pages that just felt really realistic of making such a contemporary story sci-fi. I adored the colours, I adored the artwork, probably one of my favourite things about it. I do think that it, the second half of it was too condensed. This is a short graphic novel and if you've seen the book The Count of Monte Cristo you know it's huge, it's over a thousand pages, so having to condense such a big detailed story into so few pages I think it struggled. I do think it kind of lent on people having read the original a bit too much for my liking. I think it's really good when retellings can stand alone and you don't have to read the original to read the retelling and that is absolutely not the case here. I would have been lost if I hadn't read the original story and it made some of the really key moments in the narrative a bit less effective because of the fact that it didn't have the kind of backstory that the original gives you. I do think this book had a bit of like female over sexualization what the men wear compared to the women is kind of ridiculous like the women are showing so many so much skin and it's strange because this is a cli-fi book and the men are like all wrapped up against the elements because it's so dangerous outside but the women are still wearing quite exposing and like bodily shape showing stuff and I'm like that doesn't make any sense in this narrative and it's never really addressed and it's never really unpacked and it just made me uncomfortable how well dressed all the men are versus how well dressed the women are and how the women were drawn and depicted over how the men were drawn depicted if that makes any sense. It felt like there was a lot of sexualization of the female characters in this and it didn't really need that. And also within the original Count of Monte Cristo there is slavery within the main narrative of the original classic book and I don't love the depiction of slavery in the original classic and while this retelling did remove one layer of the slavery which is the male slave is not present, the female slave still is in this one and they kind of talk about it in terms of kind of try to make it less bad but I don't think it works and it made me uncomfortable to see that even in a world where all the main characters were black there were still elements of slavery being thrown in there but it was more so female slavery over slavery based on ethnicity or slavery based on gender and with the way that the women were drawn this all just contributed to me feeling a bit uncomfortable with that so while I do think in the beginning it was off to a hot to trot start I don't think it followed through all the way and I liked it but I just didn't love it as much as the original and while I do say I love the original I do agree that the original also has sexism and racism in it so it's a it's a bit of a case of it is the way the narrative goes but with retellings you have the opportunity to change a lot more than the original had. Next I'm going to talk about a book that I think is really really important and I rated it five stars and it's a new favourite and that's The Arcology of Loss by Sarah Tarlow. So this book is emotional, <laughs> it's emotionally heavy so be prepared. We follow this woman who it's a memoir so it's a true story she had a husband her and her husband were going through a rocky patch in their marriage when he suddenly is ill he becomes ill he becomes disabled he has a he cannot be diagnosed the doctors are flabbergasted they don't understand what's happening to him they don't understand his 
spiral downwards in terms of mobility and ability to take care of himself. She kind of becomes his carer and it's due to the fact that she's his wife but it's also made extra complicated by the fact that their relationship was not going great when it started to happen, when everything started to kick off. She is a mother, she is now a full-time carer while also trying to hold down a full-time job. I am not giving you spoilers by saying this because it's literally the outcome of this book. The husband dies and the husband dies of his own accord. This happens right at the beginning of the book and then it rewinds back to where everything starts to unravel where he starts to fall ill and it follows how she goes in this carer journey and it is so emotional there's just so much emotion that goes into being a carer that goes into being a carer of someone you've shared a whole life with that goes into being a mother that goes into being a working woman and in some ways I really like how this book frames things. She's an archaeologist so she it frames things within her research. She spent years and years looking at the archaeology behind loss, the things that are left behind, um, funeral practices, funeral festivals of history and she uses that knowledge and that knowledge of the sacrifices people made in history and what people have left behind to kind of give a narrative and focus to how she's feeling about caring for her husband, how she feels about the choice that her husband made without her, and also how she feels about the grief that she's experiencing post all of this. There's a lot of grief in this, as you can tell. There's grief that comes with history and humanity and society and what we've done around grief before and what we haven't done, but also the grief that she's experiencing in the moment of being a carer. It's all non-fiction as well, which just makes it hit all the harder because there's so much emotion that goes into it. And I appreciate Sara Tarlow, who wrote this book, for just being so honest and raw and upfront with us. She does not sugarcoat anything. She talks about her experiences. She tells it how it was. She tells the beautiful moments that she has. She tells about the angry moments that she has and the sad moments. She talks about when she was amazing and she goes above and beyond for her husband. And she does things that most wives I feel like might not have been able to make it through but she also talks about the times where she could have been more sympathetic where she could have been more caring and I think there's that's just something about the realistic point of being a carer there are moments when you have to think about yourself as an individual but you cannot forget the fact that you are caring for someone else and you need to think about them too and what they are going through you've got to be sympathetic and unsympathetic at the same time and it's really difficult sometimes so yes I just think if you've read me before you and you thought that was a fantastic look at euthanasia and being a carer and disabled representation it really isn't for any of those things and you should read this book because this is non-fiction this is real life even though this is all about her and all about her perspective she is so good at being aware of the fact that there is a man who is at the center of this story whose thoughts and feelings you can't hear about whatsoever it just felt so sensitively and so realistically and so brutally honestly done that I could not give this book any less than five stars, that I could not think it was emotional, that I could not see myself in it in some ways, that I could not think it was just one of the greatest things ever. And this is definitely one of the favorite books I've read this year. It was a whole experience. So I did mention that I read a lot of non-fiction last month. So another non-fiction book I read was Time Come by Linton Cressy Johnson, who you might know as a very beloved and well-known Jamaican British poet and also Jamaican British musician and also Jamaican British essayist. And this is a collection of selected prose works of his. So it's broken down into sections. One of the sections talks about reggae music, about certain artists, about the history of reggae and Jamaican culture, because of course that is very largely tied into reggae music. Another section talks about Jamaican literature and Jamaican British literature. Another section on Jamaican and Jamaican British poetry. But amongst all of this, amongst all of this prose that's about certain topics also talking about Jamaican history, Jamaican culture, what it's truly like to be a Jamaican living in Jamaica but then also later on in his life what it's like to be Jamaican British because he moves to Britain at a certain point and he becomes British and he's lived here for several years and there is racism and he is going through the point where racism was just really bad and police brutality was really bad and riots were happening and that shows in the poetry and music and the black community that was around in that time. He talks about all of that within this and to me personally as someone who is Jamaican British this book felt like coming home it felt like I was learning about a lot of Jamaican history that I did not know I never was taught it wasn't like 
told to me and so I was learning a lot about Jamaican history specifically focused on what happened in Jamaica and also about although there was a lot about Jamaican musicians and poets that I do know as someone who reads and listens to Jamaican music I also learned about new figures that I wasn't aware of and also the analysis and unpicking of those music songs and poems that I know very well was just fascinating to me because I got to learn so much about so much material but of course I also learned more about Jamaican British history which sometimes I guess as someone who is Jamaican British and currently living in Britain you don't feel like you need to look into the history because you're fo so focused on what you're experiencing now but it is important to look back at that history and to learn about it and I appreciate that I got to do so with this book while also getting some good literature and poetry recommendations and also getting to learn more about poets and writers that I love in depth. I think Linton Quincy Johnson has a great sense of voice, has a great sense of style. There was one section that dragged me. I didn't like the literature section as much. It is also the shortest section. So while I didn't care about his book reviews because I tend to watch book reviews over read them, they were nice enough, I think they would work for other people, but I was more invested in the poetry and music side of things and the history side of things and his own personal experiences side of things. Very good, very much recommend. I have a reading vlog up about this, but I read The Haunting of Aveline Jones by Phil Hicks. I read this as part of my Friends Choose My TBR video, so I'll leave a link to that down below and up here. And I'm not going to speak too much on this one. It's a middle grade horror book about a young girl who goes to stay with her aunt for a period of time and she finds this book which is the diary of a missing girl and she's kind of investigating what happened and there are strange things happening in the town as well. I thought this was really lovely, it was adequately spooky, if you're a child reading this you're definitely going to be spooked out. I do think it was a bit slow to happen, there was a lot of build up but in some ways that is the gothic genre distilled into middle grade and how it happens. Slow, steady, creeping atmosphere and then everything unfolding at once at the end. So I could see why it did that even though I didn't particularly love it as much as an adult reading it. Good, but not good enough for me to continue the series and I have more thoughts in that vlog. I read Brown Girls by Daphne Pelosi Andre Dardis. So this one follows black and brown girls growing up in... Queens, New York. I read this in a couple of hours. I just sped through it. It was very easy to read. This one, it's literally just that. It's following these women growing up in Queens, New York, and it's talking about their different experiences they have, falling for different kinds of people, with different kinds of parents, from different kinds of religions, and how that impacts all of their experiences. But it is told uniquely because it's using the we narrative. So it's talking about we black girls do this, we black girls do that, we black girls feel this kind of way. And it kind of talks about individual experiences but also while using the collective we. And it was fine. I don't think I loved this, I don't think I'm gonna remember it for very long. I think it suffered from using the collective we and not having individual characters because then it just became about themes. It didn't come become about a certain character from a certain walk of life having this perspective and being friends with a different kind of woman who has this perspective because they are lighter in ethnicity or because they are Muslim black versus Christian black. So rather than get to see those individual experiences they're kind of wrapped up in an anonymous we voice collective and it didn't it didn't hit for me because in terms of dealing with these themes which are about identity and race and experiences you lose that if you don't have individual characters because identity race and experience are so tied to who you are as a person so making it that collective we means you lose that element to it you lose that closeness to the themes and so that didn't really work and while I appreciate the themes that it touched on and talked on and I think they're important things it would have been better if it was done in individual narratives in individual people who are in a tightly wrapped friendship group so it kind of missed because of stylistic choices but the meat the content of the story is there at the same time I feel really strangely about this one also I read it quite quickly so I was able to turn those pages so it's not a bad book necessarily but I could think it could have been written more effectively. Indie Book Awards so I read Marv and the po Pool of Peril by Alex Felisa Coya and illustrated by Paula Bowles. This is a early middle grade book like an early chapters middle grade book about a uh, Marv who is a superhero and he needs to save them from this swimming pool that's filled with robotic sharks because of a certain villain and he is afraid of swimming and he's afraid of the water. So it's about overcoming fears and you know fighting those fears so that you
you can better be with your friends and protect your friends and support your friends and I thought it was really really lovely it's got some really good like themes and messages within it it's nice to see black characters it's nice to see a black superhero character I think children are really wrapped up in the whole Marvel DC mentality right now they want to be reading about superheroes and although there's, there's comics to turn to it's nice that there's like chapter books and easy readers where you where they're specifically for children so they're not going to have those mature themes in them and it's about them being a superhero in a kind of everyday sense I think that's really lovely it was really lovely the middle grade book again so we have a like more mature middle grade chapter book and that's the Lizzie and Bell mysteries this is portraits and poison it's by JT Williams and it's illustrated by Simone Douglas and this is the second book in a series so I'm jumping in in the middle and this one is a historical fiction mystery we've got two black main characters and the a painting that is going to be entered into a competition and it features like black people front and center which is quite revolutionary for its time it gets stolen and it goes missing and so these two young children decide they're going to take it upon themselves to find out what happened why it's gone missing and why children black children seem to be going missing too I really like this so I am jumping into the middle of a series so I'm aware that I've lost some of the backstory between the friendships of these characters but I appreciated the fact that the first few chapters kind of wrap things up so you're not, I wasn't too lost in the story. It does such a good job of being a historical fiction and having black main characters and not ignoring the fact that slavery happened. It's set just in the space of time where slavery is being pushed back against but it's not entirely abolished yet and so black people are starting to thrive but people don't want to see black people thriving and it deals with that duality happening really really well but the book is not about that I was so impressed with how it mentions that and it features that and it's kind of woven into the storyline for some ways but at its core this book is about a missing painting and the wanting to find the missing painting and that is the main focus and that is the mystery that's unraveling but it's talking about all of this stuff happening in the background in a way that is suitable for children that children can understand and ask questions about the history of slavery but also children can get lost in a really fun mystery where these two children are trying to find a missing painting I appreciated that the mystery was complex enough for a middle grade audience to be able to understand it but also to be challenged by it which is perfect it has some really cute illustrations in it which are nice they're all in black and white and it's just a nice visual addition and I thought the ending was really wholesome I loved the messages in the ending there was one thing that kind of hangs me up about this book and that there is guns used in the book and the gun use is higher than any gun use I've seen in a middle grade book before. I'm not saying it's loads, but it is part of the final fight and people are held at gunpoint in this book, which I feel some type of way about. I'm all for gun abolishment and I don't know if I want guns featured that much in middle grade that I recommend to people. I think that's going to be a personal choice between each parent and each teacher and each guardian of giving a book to someone to read but I thought it was worth flagging because if you're a parent or a teacher or a guardian who's going to be recommending this book to a child you might want to know that going in. I don't really know how I feel about it it's the first time I've had to consider if I feel some type of way about it in such a strong sense and I, I need to make up my mind. I don't have children so it's not like I need to make up my mind now but in terms of recommending books like this I need to make up my mind and last but not least the last book I'm going to talk to you about is a non-fiction self-help book and it's called The Art of Starting it's by Iona Mathesian and Romy St. Clair and it's for if you want to start a business how do you go about that and it particularly focuses on sage flowers which is a flower business that the two authors set up and they are based in southeast London and they realized that there was not any diverse flower business and the flower business is very typically white so they wanted to mix it up they wanted to bring something new and they started from zero they didn't have any money to get them started they were really just both working full-time jobs and how do you start a business in that environment I think hearing about their personal story in this one was just so interesting to me how they got it off the ground how much time they had to dedicate to it how much was resources how many resources I should say I found that all really fascinating and I appreciate that this book goes and they interview and talk to many other people who started up startups and started their own business and so even though you get to hear about their particular experience you also get to see how it might differ depending on different types of people depending on different types of businesses very very fascinating to me 
and lots of them come from side hustles and again that felt quite applicable to me because in some ways I do have a YouTube channel, I do have social media platforms and while not all of them are monetized I do make a small amount of income from these platforms. And of course there are lots of tips and tricks and advice in this which I felt like all of it was very sturdy and very useful. Lots of the like marketing and brand element that particular chapter, those particular chapters to me were very helpful and insightful and had things that I going to take away and apply. I also, from the design chapter as well, there was a lot that I was writing down and highlighting and thinking, I could do that, I could do this, especially someone who's recently started a Patreon. So very, very valuable self-help book that I would recommend to anyone who's thinking of starting a business or who wants to make more money and avenue from their hobbies and side hustles. And there you have it. Those are all of the books that I read in the month of May. Please let me know in the comment section down below what book do you want to read next. Give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it, hit the subscribe button if you want to see more and don't you forget to hit that notification bell to be updated every time I have a new video and you know what they say, onwards and upwards. Excelsior!